Welcome to the Futurist Society podcast, where we delve into the latest advancements in technology, science, and culture. From discussions on the latest breakthroughs in AI, biotechnology, and space exploration, the Futurist Society is your window into all of the awesomeness that the future holds. Get ready to be informed and inspired as we consider the positive impact of emerging technologies on humanity. Without further ado, welcome your host, Dr. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Futurist Society, where we are talking in the present, but talking about the future. As always, I have a really interesting and awesome guest for you. We have Mark Greeny, who is the writer of the Gray Man series of novels, and he's coming out with a new book that's all about the applications of artificial intelligence, as well as some really interesting concepts that I think are near future science fiction. So I'm really excited to talk to him about what he thinks that the future holds for all of us. So welcome, Mark. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, also the new book that you have coming out. I think everybody's familiar with, you know, this genre, especially the the fact that you've written 20 books in the Gray Man series. But, you know, we'd love to know who you are, where you get your inspiration from, and also why you decided to kind of change tactics a little bit and talk about this technology that I think is on everybody's mind. So go ahead and let us know where you're coming from and and where your mind is at when you wrote this book. Yeah, and and thank you so much for having me. It is uh, it's very true. This is a different type of a book for me. Um, when you when you write thrillers, political, military, and espionage thrillers, there's sort of a uh, a finite list of typical geopolitical foes, you know, that America's up against or your heroes up against. And that gets tiring after, as you said, 20 books, actually, my this is my 24th published novel. Um, oh, wow. and, and so, it, it, you know, you don't want to just keep going back to, uh, you know, North Korea is the bad guy every time, you know, that mm-hmm. gets a little silly. So I was just fascinated. I've been fascinated with artificial intelligence and, uh, you know, these private um, AI labs and the nexus between them and military and the potential for weaponization of of that. And I started doing research, you know, for a book. This is the 13th Gray Man book. So, uh, you know, I sort of have it down that I do my research for about six months while I'm writing. And then, you know, I just finish up writing. And and as I was doing the research, I became really fascinated with the ethics of it. Uh, you know, the potential for good and the potential for harm. Um, artificial intelligence is dual use. <laughs> it, mm-hmm. can, it can be used for good and it can be used for bad. And the same the the same technologies that are being created for positive aims can also be you know misused and so the ethics of it became very interesting to me and you know i'm i'm trying to write an action packed spy thriller so at the end of the day the book is about human beings and it's not about uh you know computer code or anything like that but i wanted to sort of show how um you know potentially a, a bad actor could could weaponize yeah. artificial intelligence. Well, it's definitely an arms race, right? Mm-hmm. Like I think that we're all reading in the news about how each country. So I feel like back in the 20 teens, the idea of autonomous robots having the ability to uh, take a person's life, for example, mm-hmm. was it was out there. Russia had these uh, these drones that it was using to patrol their um their nuclear sites and it wasn't manned just because they didn't have the manpower and it was something that came in like the scientific literature like is this ethical or not and we we kind of left it as a a gray space just because the fact is is that it wasn't an american actor that was doing this and so you know to to each their own right and now um i feel like it's much more ubiquitous you know we're using a lot of like autonomous vehicles in our own military uh what did you find in your research that you felt like was the most significant that for you that made you say, okay, this is the, this is the big bad that I have to talk about. Well, you're absolutely right. It is an arms race in speed, which is based and and the the two principal players in this are China and the United States. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, the, the possibility that any bad actor, you know, the, the United States invented the aircraft and the airplane but then by the 1940s, we had no advantage in that because technology 
proliferates right. <laughs> always. Right. And um, right. so it, it, we did have an advantage with aircraft because uh, we were using aircraft carriers. So it was basically how we implemented it. So, mm -hmm. you know, where we are now that, uh, yeah, Turkey has some drones with autonomous features. Russia has drones with autonomous features. Iran does as well. Mostly they have uh, the, the AI on board is for image classification. It's not necessarily, um, you know, making the decision to, to kill on their own. And, you know, in the war in Ukraine right now, there's, the Ukrainians are losing 10,000 drones a month. And that's mm -hmm. actually very worthwhile. It's, it's, a, uh, the military calls it a tritable. Um, they're, they're cheap to lose. See, these are right. $400 drones out of China and they're packing, you know, a real punch. Right. And if you lose 10,000 of them, that's 4 million bucks a month. And, a you know, one F-16 fighter plane is $63 million. Um, yeah. so, you know, the calculus definitely tends towards this as being much more significant in a wartime setting. Yes, absolutely. And uh, one of, you know, the, the positives of that are, I mean, you know, a lot of people think, well, well, we'll have, you know, machines fighting our wars for us and that will save lives. But, mm -hmm. you know, my understanding of history says otherwise, unfortunately, because Richard Gatling invented the Gatling gun back in the 1800s and his goal was to save lives because you could put four people on the battlefield that could do the work of a hundred people. So obviously you're going to save lives right. and obviously that's not how it turned out. So, exactly. I mean, you know, I, I do have a positive view of artificial intelligence in a whole lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's, you know, it accelerates the decision-making process. So if, if you want a medical diagnosis, that is awesome. <laughs> that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Um, but if you, you know, if you're being, you know, pursued by a kamikaze drone, that's right. not awesome. <laughs> so right. it, again, right. it's all it's all in the ethics and it's all in how it's being used. Yeah. So like what what is what is actually being used right now that you found in your research that maybe you incorporated into your book? Like I, I know that, you know, when we're talking about the arms race, uh, I feel like a, a while ago, supercomputing was was uh, a big thing. You know, a lot of money was being invested into that. Now it's artificial intelligence. And certainly you must have seen something in your research that said, okay, wow, like this is really interesting. And like, this is something that I want to talk about. Yeah. On, the robotics platforms are interesting. Um, that's the sexy aspect of it, you know, as far as like, there are uh, quadruped, um, yeah. you know, carrying 6.5 Creedmoor rifles yeah. that are, you know, are able to be deployed. Uh, the China has uh, drones that will actually deploy these robot dogs with rifles mm. on their backs and can wow. drop them off on a roof rooftop. And then the, uh, the aircraft can go loiter while it, you know, while the fight happens and then come pick it up and, and fly away. Wow. So those, those are, I, I don't think they're being fielded yet, but they're mm -hmm. um, definitely, there's nothing in this book that is not e existing or emerging technology. So a lot of it, I saw a prototype of it. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so I've, I've extended it into the near future when, when these things are weaponized and, and, and the Chinese, you know, have aims to create a, a special forces unit just of robots um, that, mm -hmm. that they can deploy overseas. Wow. And so the, the robotics aspect of it is, you know, you're sort of asking me like what's scariest or, or what's you know <laughs> on, on the horizon. Yeah. But, but honestly, I think the first thing that we all are going to encounter is, um, the ability to use AI for misinformation and disinformation. And Interesting. I think that's already here and it's already growing. And the internet yeah. is the internet is the central nervous system of our civilization. And, um, you know, to the ability that, you know, that machine learning and, and can create just so much out there that's not real. And it's, it's going to have that, effect of having us question and, and, and doubt things. And so that, you know, the, the good side of it is there, um, you know, you want AI to take over the jobs that, that are dangerous, dirty <laughs> or dull. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, but at the same time, you know, you got the, you got the negative. Yeah. I mean, I hope that, um, that's something that we see less of. I know that that's something that especially Congress is talking about, about the disinformation capabilities of not only AI, but just the internet in general. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's one of the things that I think is really great about people like you that are writing what I consider to be like near future science fiction. It gives us a sense of what is possible so that we don't have to live it in real life before we respond to it. You know? Right. 
So that's something that I think has always been one of the reasons why I love science fiction is because when you plan these things out in advance, it makes for a much more smoother reality for us because we've we've already thought about the 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 potential negative aspects of it. Yeah. Um, but I, I I think that you know this idea of artificial intelligence being incorporated into the military could be a good one. Like, uh, have you seen in your research for this book? Uh, for the chaos agent, any positive aspects other than the idea of your being removed from the battlefield? Because I feel like if I was a soldier, you know, the ability to have real time intelligence, you know, with uh, with some sort of like, I don't know, I, AI assistant that was able to give me like real time battlefield information. I don't know if that exists or not, but obviously mm -hmm. you're a lot closer to this than than I am. So tell us a little bit about that. Do you see any positive aspects for the for the military at all? Absolutely. Um, from things as as mundane and, and unsexy as logistics and, mm -hmm. um, you know, repair schedules and all this sort of stuff can can be handled and, and is being utilized by the uh, the military. Uh, there was a project, uh, a thing called Project Raven several years ago with the Defense Department where they uh, and they're doing it full time now, but it, it sort of began with Project Raven where they used artificial intelligence to look over tens of thousands of hours of drone footage, look look with image classifiers on there, looking for, uh, you know, instead of having intelligence analysts just watch thousands and thousands of hours, mm -hmm. you know, looking for whatever they're looking for, um, AI could do it. And this was done mm -hmm. with Google, and it, it kind of blew up in everyone's face because uh, people at Google you know, wrote a letter saying that they didn't want to work with the, you know, with the military because it's weaponizing. It was not, a, there was no weaponization of this whatsoever. It was just employing AI in, in a way that it's supposed to be employed. You know, artificial intelligence is either um, analytical or predictive or operational. And this was sort yeah. of just analytical. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, you know, who knows, it, it might be the employees at Google might feel differently now, but at the time they they absolutely didn't want to work with the military. My concern is that, you know, if, if China is, uh, be, is a threat to us and they turn the keys over, mm -hmm. you know, in a large sense, you know, in the military, then we will, we will have to do the same, but mm -hmm. absolutely the, the robotics wise, there are, uh, you know, these pack mule, uh, four legged robots you may have seen before that the Marines are fielding, um, yeah. that <clears throat> can do so much. Now they are, they are primarily in, in most cases they're, they're driven. They're, they're mm -hmm. not, it's not all artificial intelligence, but it is robotics. And mm -hmm. of course they have artificial intelligence on board. That's how they keep from slipping and falling and tripping over things, um, by using AI and kind of, uh, you know, the, the, um, the different different means to you know keep balance and keep on mission they're they're yeah. assigned a mission and they do it but um you know we're going to see fewer and fewer drone pilots and more and more on board um artificial intelligence systems in the future and you know if it's your military using it it's all good yeah. <laughs> if it's the other military using it it's probably all bad but uh yeah. but i i do think there's a lot of you know in, in, in your example if you were a soldier yeah, if I was a, a 20 year old kid that was like climbing the mountains of Afghanistan, I'd love to have something there taking, uh, you know, my 80 pound pack off of my back and helping me or, yeah. uh, you know, analytically the the drones the over the horizon drones uh, letting me know what's what's coming up. So how does the military feel about it? I mean, I, you know, I'm sure that there's a I, from what I know of you, you do a lot of research and very closely knit with a lot of these uh, embedded organizations, like you actually go and you train with them and, you know, you do a lot of stuff that's very close to the military. And I'm sure that you have, um, off the record conversations, or at least like, you know, um, a, a little bit more social conversations where you can kind of get their idea of how they feel about this new technology. Do they feel like it's something that they're excited about? Or, I mean, you know, all the propaganda side, I'm sure every technology, like they're going to say that they're excited about, but like, are mm -hmm. they, did they have the same concerns that I think that the rest of the public does with oversight and things like that? Yes. Um, so in my private conversations, I heard complaints that there wasn't enough 
uh, funding for this sort of stuff. But I, I imagine mm -hmm. you hear that in yeah. any private conversation with with someone in the military. But right. um, but you know th th that it it was such a small percentage of the Defense Department budget, and it's such a an emerging technology with so much potential. So, you know, I heard different versions of that along the way, but yeah, no, that, I think that, I think there's a lot of excitement in the military about it. Um, and, and the analytical stuff as as much as the weaponization, as much as the operational stuff, I think is really interesting, but on the, on the weaponization side in the military, they refer to something called the OODA loop, O-O-D-A, which was actually created or, you know, identified by a, an Air Force pilot in the 1950s named John Boyd. And uh, UDA is it's a paradigm of combat. So it's basically how you uh, how you fight, observe, mm. it's observe, orient, decide and act. Mm. And the, the U.S. military and official Defense Department doctrine is that there will on the UDA loop, which is how every engagement takes place, there will always be a human on the loop or in the loop in the loop means actually making that decision on the loop means overseeing the decision that the uh, artificial intelligence is making. So that is official doctrine. And, and in private conversations, I never heard anything other than that, except for everyone's concern that if, you know, the, the human is the ultimate circuit breaker, which is great mm -hmm. ethically, but mm -hmm. it's also the weak link when you're talking about machine speed and, and um, you know, tactical and operational overmatch that uh you know pure ai would would you know pose to something where there a human is the one doing it so i think that is their concern but i you know the development is is going as as fast and as hard as fund you know funding will allow at this point yeah so at least in the u.s military there's always going to be oversight in the decision between taking somebody's life, right? Like that, mm -hmm. that's, is that something that you've, you've been exposed to? I, I don't know if that is, that is actual doctrine or not, but I yeah. know that Russia that specifically with those uh, drones that are protecting, um, you know, their, their nuclear sites back in the 20 teens, that was something that was came up as an ethics. Yeah. Do. Is that something that the U.S. military is taking the high ground on? Yes, uh, that is that is their doctrine. Uh, the Defense awesome. Department says that they will, you know, there will always be a human on or in the loop, and mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think that that, you know, that's that's why the ethics of this are so interesting to me because it's it's not so cut and dried. Uh, you know, when I was a young kid in college, I just thought every problem there was an obvious solution for. And then as I've gotten older and, you know, the deeper you get into the type of you know research that I do, mm -hmm. a lot of times you just scratch your head and you go, okay, well, I see why this is so complicated because again, the ethics are great. The ethics go out the window the day, mm -hmm. you know, the enemy does something else. And, um, you know, President Xi in China has said uh, science and technology is the ultimate battleground with the West. And mm -hmm. they are all in on this. Um, they have an aging population in China. They have some other, uh, you know, gosh, you know, they're, they're and in, going back to the positive. China is doing some amazing things with port automation and with mining, uh, with using robotics and artificial intelligence. So they're they're not just applying it to. The military they're applying it to every way that they think you know it can make uh, life more efficient for for mm -hmm. them and mm -hmm. you know good, good on them for that but mm -hmm. uh you know in the united states the u.s military officially says that uh and and i don't say that as a caveat you know i'm saying as far as i know <laughs> that that there will always be a human on that decision making loop yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I I do feel like maybe it's just patriotism or, or whatever, but I do feel like we we tend to make decisions with at least some sort of ethics that are involved. At least yeah. So I think that there's probably other people that might disagree, but that's just the way that I feel about it. The, yeah. But let me let me ask you, you know, something that you talked about is that China has this stuff enveloping really a, a lot of different industries, right? And something mm -hmm. um, we're probably going to see within the next 10 years, like we're probably going to have an AI assistant that says, Hey, can you schedule me a haircut? And then it's going to, it's going to be able to do that and know you well enough to know your schedule and, and get it to the, at your favorite barber. Um, 
you know, you're you're very close with, uh, you know, at least from your books, you're very close with like a lot of these uh, organizations, or at least you talk about a lot of these organizations that I feel like people have concerns with like privacy and stuff like that. Um, how do you feel like in your regular life? Like, are you doing anything different when are you are you excited about this technology or are you kind of hesitant? Like, do you do you have an Alexa at home or do you like what what is your normal life like? Like, because, you know, a lot of the a lot of the stuff that you write about is like the worst case scenario, right? Like, yeah, characters yeah. They're going after each other, you know, really interesting character backstories and stuff. But, you know, certainly like the 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 most extreme version of these kinds of technologies but just how does mark greeny use technology like in his everyday life do you have some hesitance when it comes to this kind of stuff or are you like a, a somebody that's like an early adopter where, where do you lie on the spectrum um there's a massive disconnect between the uh the the whatever the the negative aspects of it in my book and and how i live my life personally i think we probably have about eight Alexas because I have three kids. <laughs> I have three kids. Yeah, um, they always seem to go online when you know yeah. it's time for dinner. I mean, go offline when it's time for dinner. And uh, yeah. but no, I was I was in um, on my book tour. I was in uh, Phoenix uh, uh -huh. a couple a couple weeks ago, and they have Waymos, which is the yeah. the 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 robot cars, like completely yeah. self driving cars. My wife did not want to get in one of those. And really? I, I wanted to. So she she was fine. I mean, you yeah. know, and they're Jaguars. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's yeah. and and we rode uh, probably about five of those. And one of them was like about a 40 minute drive. And yeah, I mean, it was and it was perfect. And and not to be negative, but uh, that when we were leaving Phoenix uh, after the tour, um, you know, we had a five, we had to be at the airport, like at leave at 5 a.m. or something. And I said, I'm just going to call a, a regular driver. And um, <laughs> because it's like, I don't know what it's like at the airport with the Waymos, like if they have to park somewhere else or whatever. So I'm just getting it. Right. So, you know, after after two days of driving around in these incredible vehicles that got you right where you wanted to go, clean, efficient, you know, all that sort of stuff. I got picked up by a guy that reeked of alcohol at 5 oh 5.15 in the morning. And oh, I kind of was geez. like, you know, when we got out of the car, I was looking at my wife and I was going, you're worried about the robots. Um, you know, it's like <laughs> human uh, beings, right? You just you, said that they're the they're the weak link in this whole chain, right? Yeah, unfortunately. But yeah, it, so in in all aspects, you know, I've I've played around with Chat GPT mostly for um purposes of like understanding it as I was doing the research. Mm -hmm. Um at, at one point I asked it to write me 50 titles for my next book. Uh, and you know, I just gave it some parameters and I didn't use any of them, but I mean it actually mm -hmm. gave me it gave me ideas. It sort of led mm -hmm. me in a direction. So, you know, one thing that I've come across on this uh, book tour is I'll be interviewed by some radio station somewhere and the DJ will be like, yeah, I don't know what all the concern is, is about this because, uh, you know, I tried to get AI to write a song about my dog and it, you know, didn't rhyme or something, you know, like they'll, mm -hmm. they'll find some flaw and say that this is, you know, nothing to worry about. And and I'm like, well, it's, it's in its infancy right now. Mm -hmm. And right now, not in the future, not emerging right now, um, artificial intelligence can beat any American fighter pilot in a simulator. Uh, oh. In fact, the, the really famous uh, example of this was uh, a few years ago, there was you know, a bunch of, uh, different software companies competed to go up against a, a human in the simulator and that we got a really good F-16 pilot and the company that won that, uh, you know, went toe to toe in a dog fight and won 15 to zero and the human never got a shot off. And the, and the artificial intelligence was fighting in ways that it had not been taught how to fight. Wow. So it's pulling itself up by its bootstraps and, um, and teaching itself. It was doing something, called front quarter shots, which is where you're going nose to nose with your adversary and firing missile. And well, humans are not trained to do that because when you're going Mach 1 and somebody else is going Mach 1, you, you tend to try and get behind them and not in front of them to yeah. fight. So, you know, it was just fighting completely different. And artificial intelligence has scored human level scores on the SAT and the bar exam and other things right. like that. So anyone who says it's not sophisticated um, is doesn't have that forward thinking view you know mm -hmm. it's like we're we're already at this stage and the computing power that's going oh. into ai has increased 10 billion percent since the year 2010 and the yeah. the data used by ai is like doubling every nine months or something like that 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that what people worry about in those situations is some sort of replacement with artificial intelligence. But, you know, I think that, or at least I hope that it's more of a symbiosis, you know, yeah. where we where we leverage that technology to become better versions of ourselves and the right. fighter pilots will be able to use that, those same kind of techniques and stuff. Yes. But certainly, you know, that, that artificial intelligence is not susceptible to the same kind of physiologic limitations, right? Like they could probably push the aircraft and G forces that a human being wouldn't be able to withstand. Right. That's part of it. And the other part of it is it doesn't care about uh, getting home to the wife and children in one piece and, right. and, and things like that. So, right. Right. Uh, you know, uh, the human brain is the most powerful processor in the world. And, you know, nothing I saw makes me think that's going to change. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think, you know, everyone talks about, you know, it becoming sentient or conscious like Skynet or something. I, I think at some point artificial intelligence will become sophisticated enough to be commensurate with human intelligence, but not, in any way shape or form human mm -hmm. so i i'm I, I don't really with all my concerns and all my sort of you know like you know waving the flag uh i i don't see that happening i i just see um you know whether the question is in a military field whether we can leverage it better than our adversaries and, mm -hmm. and yeah yeah no i i i mean i hate to classify people as like adversaries and not just because like I know that there's human beings on the other end of of course of, of like the Chinese AI mm -hmm. but for whatever reason you know and correct me if I'm wrong you've done more research into this and like you know I don't know if it's just my patriotic bias I was born and raised in the U.S. and you know I think that I have this idea that the U.S. is more ethical in its implementation and its use of this kind of stuff I just haven't seen that from other countries that are that are using this technology. I mean, uh, is that just my own bias talking or is it something that is an actual fact? Well, it, if it's your bias, it's probably a bias that we share. But I mean, my you know, just looking at China and stepping away from AI for a second, the reason China um, is the number one miner of rare earth minerals on planet Earth is not that they have more rare earth minerals than the United States or anywhere else. It's because, you know, regular, they have no sort of really regulatory, you know, barriers to just destroying the environment for mm -hmm. the purposes of, of extracting the rare earth minerals. And you could, mm -hmm. you know, I hate to extrapolate that, you know, over everything, but in the United States, we are we're slowed and possibly for good reason. Our military is slowed by you know regulations and, and rules and the Chinese don't have it. Our our private AI labs um, have more rules over them than uh, what's happening in China. In China, there's 238 large language models developed in China. And wow. I, I think there's very little other than the the. The Chinese government wants the technology and has access to the technology. Um, you know, in the United States, I think we're we're more careful with it. In China, there, there's a there's a billion uh, um, facial or whatever a billion security cameras in the world, and half a billion of them are in China. And China, mm. is, is, using AI, um, is the number one leader in facial recognition software and all that. Yeah. And unfortunately, they've exported that to 80 different countries in Africa and in Asia and um, in, in Central and South America. So that technology is kind of hoovering up all this data that um, that can be used. And that's something that, you know, companies in the United States would not not be allowed to do in the same way. Yeah. How do you feel about the surveillance state comparison between China and the U.S.? Like, I, I, I mean, I know like when you go to New York City, there's cameras everywhere, right? Yeah. And, and so there's there's definitely some sort of um, technological progress on that front in the US as well. And I think that personally, like, you know, I, I, I don't see a lot of like the negative aspects of it, but like you're very close to it, especially it's something that you write about in your books. Um, how do you feel about that? Well, I, I'm okay with it, honestly, because I, I, I feel like there are there are pretty good um, you know, safeguards legally of what can be used and what cannot be used. I, I live in Memphis, Tennessee, and it's a city with unfortunately very high crime. 
and uh, uh, and getting worse. And it does not bother me at all that there is a camera on the end of my street with a blue light flashing over it, so people know that you know they're they're being watched. Now, is anyone monitoring it on the other end? I don't know if the Memphis Police Department actually has somebody there. I know they're not using artificial intelligence to. Um, to fight, you know, to find the dangers out there at this stage, but I'd love, I'd love that to be in the future. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think you see a ton of cameras here. You see a lot more if you're in London, for example, um, if you were in China, I, last time I was in China was 2013. So it's been a long time. Um, there were a lot then, but uh, there's, mm -hmm. you know, the technology has changed so quickly. There, there's a lot more now. I, I am not, you know, of of doom and gloom things to worry about. I, I am not worried about a surveillance state in the United States. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm I, yeah, I, I, you were about to, I think you were about to say you were a father, right? Or was that what you were? I, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I, I, I was I, literally thinking the same thing. I was thinking like if, if my, uh, if my two year old was like, you know, abducted or something like that, I would hope that there was cameras available, you know? Yeah. So that they, like, I think that the idea of safety versus Liberty is such a complex topic and it really depends on where you are at in your stage of life. Like I might not yes. have felt like that when I was like 16 years old and trying to buy cigarettes. Right. Like yeah. I, that's not something that, you know, that version of, of Dr. Awesome would be interested in, but yeah. now like I'm a father, like I see a lot of these like safety measures and like, I get it. Like I know it's, it's some sort of like government oversight and I know it's some sort of control, but like on the same token, like, I do feel a little bit more comfortable when, you know, my, my kid is walking to preschool and there's like, you know, seven cameras on the way, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, I, I, do you feel the same way being a dad? Absolutely. My 16 year old uh, stepdaughter just began driving a couple months ago and we put a, a thing on her phone to where we know how fast she's going, how, how quickly she's accelerating, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, where she is at all times. Mm -hmm. And I would have hated that when I was 16, I would have thought that was, you know, very intrusive, but yeah. your perspective changes as you get older, as as it should. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, I think yeah. it, I think it's probably healthy to rebel against that when you're younger, and and it would be unhealthy to rebel against that now. But um, yeah, yeah. I, I I I do think you know, sadly, it, where I live, there's a lot of crime. The the one good thing about the surveillance state, as people call it, is the crimes are usually um, filmed or. Uh, you know, the, the perpetrators caught. I mean, that's, that's not what we're looking for. <laughs> we're mm -hmm. looking to have it actually prevent crime. And, but, but it might, I mean, I, I would imagine if I was some sort of a criminal and I saw, we call them blue light cameras here. I don't know if they're all over the country, but uh, you know, it's the, the police, the, the neighborhood has to pay, has to come up with the money, you know, oh. and then the, the police will put a ca camera on your street, which uh, supposedly should lower crime. And there's no, hasn't really been any crime on my street. Uh, I can mm. get in my car and go five minutes away and find some trouble. But um, it's, mm. it's a, uh, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a good thing. And, you know, I remember the Edward Snowden stuff about 10 years ago where, you know, he, he came out and said, well, we're, we're spying on ourselves. And uh, a, a lot of people were up in arms about that. I thought he was basically, you know, a traitor for giving the intelligence he gave to China and, and, uh, and running away with it. But, uh, you know, different people disagree yeah, with that. I, I think that there's a lot, just like, you know, that your series, there's a lot of gray with all of this, with all this stuff. And yeah. it's tough to find where the true right and wrong is when it comes to a lot of this new technology. But I th yeah. think like, if you think about it, like, honestly, technology is coming, whether we like it or not. Yeah. And I think it's a tool in the same way that a hammer is a tool, you could use it to build a house or you could use it to really hurt somebody. And so we have to look at the positive aspects of technology and like, you know, for, you know, me, me as a, as a, as a father, as a, as a surgeon in 2024, I think that there's so many different aspects of technology that weren't available 20 years ago that really make my life so much easier and better and more yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, and there's negative aspects. Don't get me wrong, but I think yeah. there's a lot of positive aspects as well. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the next 20 years and artificial intelligence is definitely a component of that. I can't tell you the day, the day that they get sentient robots that are able to <laughs> hold my laundry mark, I'm going to be the first person in line for that. Like, you know, I think that that's something that's coming down the pipeline. I and, just, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. so I, I just read an article uh, yesterday about, um, 
company in China that had developed a bipedal robot that would watch you do something and then mimic it, like exactly. make yourself a cup of coffee or whatever. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's still in the developmental phase. But I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm all for that. And just think about anyone with any sort of a disability or, you know, like that, how what a game changer that could be for them. Um, there's a line in the book where somebody's, you know, asked if they're pro or anti artificial intelligence. And they're like, well, are you for or against fire? And, you know, if the, fire, <laughs> if, if the fire is keeping you warm, you're for yeah. it. If it's burning your house down, you're against it. And it's, right, it's, right. it's, that's a good it's line. like that with everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good line. Have you, have you seen the, um, the new Neuralink videos where like the, this dude has a implantable chip in his, in his head and he's able to play chess just by thinking about it. No, I've read articles about it and yeah. move it, move a cursor on a, on a screen and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was, I was just thinking like, I don't know if like in your research, anybody else is doing that other than the U S and, and Elon Musk with Neuralink, like, cause you know, there's, there's so many technologies that you probably have been researching in preparation for your book and artificial intelligence is definitely a component of it, but I didn't know if brain user interface is something that other countries are doing or if it's just the U.S. Yeah. So I, when I started writing this book, initially I was looking at like Elon Musk wanting to put a chip in everybody's brain and going like, okay, I've got an idea for, for, you know, the, the antagonist in my, in my next book. But then as I started doing the research, I became more fascinated with the, with the robotics and the, the, Defense Department's uh, link to these private AI labs. So it, it it changed, you know, it kind of morphed away from from that. But that's what I was looking yeah. at at the beginning. And I don't know if other nations are. I mean, you have to assume that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, China is just about where we are as far as development of this technology. Not quite, but just about. Um, yeah, they, they we have. Uh, access to chips that they don't have access to. And um, so they're a little bit behind us, but they're <laughs> developing very rapidly. So yeah. I, I would imagine, you know, and it, you know, again, that's something that could be used for good or used for bad. I mean, if you have a neurological disorder and a, a chip was able to fire muscles, um, you know, in, in your leg or something, <laughs> that would be, uh, you know, just so beneficial <laughs> to mm -hmm. humankind. But yeah, no, I totally agree. I think that even just the ability to have this conversation without using our laptops, right? Like that mm -hmm. would be good for humanity. I think that yeah. anytime we connect as a species, it's a good thing. You know, I think yeah. that Zoom has been so beneficial for the entirety of humanity, especially during the whole pandemic. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, book 25, man, the next person that the next antagonist for you, I think putting chips in brains, that might be a really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Interesting topic. Yeah. The it reason is, why it, I ask, th th sorry, the reason why I ask is just because I know that there's this push away from certain states and their communication devices versus other, like Huawei, right? Like there's this push mm -hmm. away from, you yeah. know, using those Chinese chips because they technically are a portion of the, the CCP or under mm -hmm. the guise of the CCP. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, what for, you know, just social media in general, like this whole push against TikTok, like TikTok. I didn't know that would be something that um that also might get that kind of pushback right but yeah for sure regardless I, I i think that that's some some interesting technology that definitely has some military applications and yeah. we talked about it i i did want to talk about one last question before we get into you know the general questions that i talk about you've written over 25 books right um you know i'm i'm trying to write myself and, you know, I'm trying to write a nonfiction book. What's your process like? Because, you know, I think that uh, every aspiring writer looks at somebody like you and says like, that guy's made it. Like he's got a movie out with his, with his uh, intellectual property. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing nonfiction stuff, but still like, you know, you are a professional in this field and I just love to know what your process is. Well, I'll start by saying that I've been an unsuccessful author a lot longer than I've been a successful author. And um, I spent, I started, I wanted to be a, a writer in 1990 and I got published in 2009. I spent 15 years trying to write my first book. I wrote wow. my second book in seven months because once I'd written a book and it was a mess, but uh, it was finished. And uh, once I look back and go, well, really, how hard did you work? Somewhere along the, the way, I realized that I loved it. And I, I really enjoyed writing and the goal was not to, you know, be, get paid a lot of money or, or be famous. It's like, this is, you know, I, I kind of had this epiphany in my late thirties and I was like, okay, you haven't found any success in this, but this is where your brain likes to, 
to go when you're walking your dog and you like to sit there and, and develop stories and write them out and, you know, struggle through the tough parts because it's very satisfying when you, when you ha can hold something in your hand. So at that point, um, you know, that everybody's, you know, coming to me and saying, you know, what, how can you inspire me? And I'm like, if you need me to inspire you, it's probably not for you. It, it, it has to be something that you really enjoy doing or really love doing, or you have this really strong sense that you have a news that you want to get out as, as you're talking about mm -hmm. nonfiction. I, I would imagine, you know, that you're passionate about something you want to talk about it. My, mm -hmm. my process at this stage in my career is I've, I'm committed to write a bunch of books. So I only have about six months to write a novel. I start uh, just brainstorming ideas and I, I kind of call it my Flash Gordon outline. Before I've done any research, I, I'll just write out just this wild story, which as I do the research, I realize what what works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then I, then I kind of step away from that and I just try and write. And I mean, the key to, to doing this job is consistency. It's not about being awesome any one day you almost yeah. never really have a great day writing because if, you know, if I totally tear the computer up and, and write 15 pages, I've written, you know, like less than 1% of, of right. my book, you know? So right, right. it's a very incremental thing. And that's why I really feel like it's something you have to love. And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time talking about wanting to be a writer. And, you know, once I'd written a book, I was like, Hey, if I didn't walk around talking about it and I just sat there and did it, I bet I would, I bet I could write a book a lot yeah. faster. And as I said, my second book, I did in seven months. Uh, yeah. That's amazing. I, I hear that all the time. And it's, that's, that's like the biggest hurdle for me is like actually being consistent with it. Yeah. So kudos yeah. to you for, you know, being able to, to stick to it and obviously make a really amazing body of work. I, I think that it's really interesting. And like I was saying, like near future science fiction is one of my favorite genres uh just because it's i feel like it, it really unfolds a lot of the stuff that's happening in the news in such a way that we can be more uh thoughtful about the direction that we're going as a species yeah. so yeah. thank you for yeah. you know, giving us your insight into how you got started and everything like that yeah. um we're getting close to the end of our time so i did want to talk with you uh, a little bit just about general questions that i ask all of my amazing and really intelligent guests, just so that I have an idea of like where their head is at. Um, the first one is like your inspiration, right? Like, I mean, I think we talked about like your love of writing, but you obviously have a genre that you picked that has really worked well and, and that interests you. What draws you to this? Where, where do you gain inspiration from? Obviously you can see from my background, like the whole reason that I like near future technology or even far future technology as science fiction. I grew up with like Star Trek and Star Wars and all these things that I want to see happen. I'm really excited that they're going to happen. So that's where I gain my inspiration from. But what about Mark Greeny? Where do you gain your inspiration from when you're writing these spy thrillers? Well, I think it started. So my father was the head of the local NBC affiliate in, in my town. And so I just grew up around the news and I, We've always been interested in uh, foreign affairs, things of that nature. So I had a I had a subscription to The Economist and U.S. News when I was like 16 years old. You know, I was I, I guess that makes me a nerd. But I read a lot of nonfiction. I, I had popular mechanics. So there was, you go. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we I think we've both gone down a, a path that, that <laughs> yeah. you could have seen earlier. Yeah. Um, and and so I spent, uh, you know, a lot of time reading nonfiction. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the Second World War uh you know, learning about it. My dad was a combat veteran in Germany in, in World War II. Um, I mean, he's an American, but he fighting in Germany, I guess I should say. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and also the civil war, because I live in the South and Shiloh is a couple hours from my house. And, you know, I just sort of grew up fascinated with that sort of thing. And then, um, you know, I, I picked, declared a major in college after reading the first thriller that I ever bought in my life was Patriot Games by Tom Clancy. And I was 19 years old. Dude, how amazing and is it you got to work with him? It, it, yeah, it's it's completely surreal. And, uh, you know, it's just a good luck because we had the same editor, but we only had the same editor because every other editor that my agent submitted me to turned me down. And the one guy who took me <laughs> was Tom Clancy's editor. And a few years later, he needed a co-author. And, you know, we started talking and I had my dad and I'd given each other the Clancy books every year for Christmas, you know, when yeah. they would come out. And so I, th that stuff just changed my life. And I books have gotten me through tough points in my life. And it's always the best compliment I can get from uh, a reader when they say, you know, like 
you know, my mom was sick and I was in the hospital every day oh and, God. you know, your books That's gave true. me, yeah. And it's and like, there's nothing greater that, that I want my books to do than that escapism and, you know, having people sort of, you know, go behind doors that they wouldn't have access to otherwise and through, through, through fiction. So that's what inspires me. It's like, I always feel like I have a better book in me and I don't have any ambition to become, you know, like more well-known or whatever. It's more like, I just want to get that next book out and make it better than the last book. Cool, man. That's really interesting. Um, so, you know, we talked a lot about different aspects of artificial intelligence. It's obviously a huge part of the chaos agent in your next book. Um, where do you see this in 10 years? Where do you, where do you see this, uh, kind of developing, um, specifically in like the, the military realm? Well, I would say in 10 years, uh, so much of our analytical, um, stuff is going to be done with, with technology. Uh, there's still going to be humans on, on the loop, I believe in 10 years. Uh, if the enemy is able to, whoever our enemy is, if the enemy is able to um, take the humans out of the loop in some way, shape, or form, um, I don't think it's going to be on a scale that's going to, def you know, they're not going to have fifth generation fighter aircraft in 10 years that that are all run by AI. I don't see that on the horizon. Um, they say, you know, the, 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 the doomsayers or whatever say that anything that's electrified can be cognitized. And mm -hmm. I, again, that could be great if it's your refrigerator telling you that yeah. your milk's gone bad and, and, it, and it could be bad if it's if it's something you know darker. But I think in the military, um, the whole sort of maintenance and log logistics and uh, shipping and all these things are going to be sort of taken, you know, the, the, the dull, dangerous and dirty jobs, you know, will be sort of taken back. I think we'll have human machine teams, you know, uh, support. From machine from robotics uh as we're starting to see now in a, in a small scale i mean obviously like bomb uh explosive ordnance detail teams have had these robots that they pilot themselves that can go you know sort of deactivate bombs and things like that that's going to be done more with artificial intelligence and drone technology is really where it's growing the fastest war is the ultimate accelerant of innovation unfortunately yeah. and yeah. if you look at what's going on in ukraine right now the drones have become so much more sophisticated and just in the past 24 months um you know that's only going to continue so i do feel like you know drones are going to be a bigger issue but i don't i don't think we will have turned over the keys to uh to Skynet or anything like that. I hope not. Yeah, <laughs> I, really hope not. I don't think so either. Like yeah. I, I, I do think that you know a lot of those those fears are overblown. But you know, I, I, I respect the the caution when it comes to this kind of technology because I yeah. do think that it's a totally new field. Yeah. Um, I appreciate your insight. Um, yeah. it, artificial intelligence aside, my last question would be like, uh, you know, all of the stuff independent of what you're an expert in. What really excites, what technology really excites you that's coming down the pipeline? Like, you know, just for your own day-to-day -day life. Like, like I was telling you, like, I can't wait until I have like a, a butler robot, right? Like that, yeah. that for me is always going to be number one. Like I cannot wait until the day happens where I don't have to fold my own laundry. Yeah, yeah. For you, like, you know, artificial intelligence aside, what, do you, what is like something that's coming in the news that you just can't get read enough of or that you're really excited about? I mean, I'm very excited about self-driving cars. I mean, I yeah. talked about it briefly. I, I was before I took my first ride in one recently, but, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. and just the technology. I remember the first time I'm driving, I'd gotten a new car and I was driving and it started raining. And before I could, you know, activate the wipers, they my, the wipers started going. And I remember just like almost parking <laughs> the car going, what is going on? Yeah. And, um, and, and, you know, now there's the lane keeping assist and all these things that really do help you. Um, right. My wife hates it. Like my wife feels like she's losing control and I'm, yeah. I'm going like, I, you know, I, I'm confident in my, in my driving ability, but I wouldn't mind somebody looking over my shoulder. Yeah. You know? and I mean, it just, if like you have like a long commute, it opens up like this protected time where you could write or you yeah. could see your yeah. family, you know, yeah. I think that like getting, getting that time back would be so huge. I mean, there's people in this, in this country that are driving hours, just Absolutely. To work, you know, like that would be a, a really huge benefit for them. So I totally yeah. see that. And I, yeah. I really hope that's you know, like, I, I, everybody says that it's like always five years away. I really hope that it's actually like down the pipeline. So yeah, I, I think it is. Yeah.
Yeah. Well, thanks so much for speaking with us. I really appreciate getting your insight. And, you know, it's it's really cool to talk to somebody that is is writing what we are going to be seeing in the near future. I think that so often we talk about the future as something that is this faraway thing, but a lot of the yeah. stuff that you're talking about is really happening right now. So I really appreciate speaking with you, and especially somebody who's so accomplished as you are with all of the, the acclaim that you've had from your books. They're really interesting. So for any of our listeners that haven't had an experience with the Gray Man series, I would really suggest it. I was a big fan of Tom Clancy, just like Mark was. And I just got reintroduced to this genre and I can't put it down. So really excited to, to read more of what he has to offer. Um, but for those other listeners who just tune in on a regular basis and can't wait to see the next episode. We will see you again in the future. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. We appreciate you taking part in today's episode. Take this chance to reimagine a better future by joining a community of futurists who strive for a remarkable world. Be a part of this growing network and contribute to making the world a more positive place. Visit thefuturistsociety.net and subscribe to the show so you don't miss a drop of hopeful futurism.